Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Foster and I'll be representing Rangitoto College today. To my left, we have our team, Suzanne Chong, David Howes, Yi Yang and David Chesterfield. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand has made the decision today to leave the OCR unchanged at 2.5%. This is done in consideration of the policy target agreement to keep inflation between 1-3% to in the medium term. The decision has been influenced by various economic factors. Internationally, these include the European, Chinese and American economic climates, Australian monetary policy and the effect that global growth is having on core imports has also been considered. Domestically, the depreciation in the TWI, decreasing commodity prices and the strengthening labour market have also been key factors, as have neutral fiscal policy, high business confidence and retail interest rates. The international climate has a large effect on the New Zealand economy and the continuing international turmoil can more than negate trends in aggregate demand. The European markets have shown strain of late. In Spain, high levels of debt have made it difficult for the government to source funds from bonds at sustainable interest rates. This required a bailout which strained financial markets, as indicated in the Spanish stock market here, with the low in June. However, a swift bailout by Eurozone um, countries has temporarily restored confidence, with share prices rising since. The Bank of England has halted quantitative easing measures, believing more would expand their balance sheets too significantly. However, with negative growth in the previous quarter, it's expected that these measures may push the United Kingdom into a recession. Although in the short run Europe is stable, there is a likelihood of recession in the United Kingdom as well as downturns in other European countries. This is due to the high GDP to debt ratios that you can see in this graph as members of the European Monetary Union do not have the ability to print money the same way the United States can. This may cause investment shocks in financial markets as concerns raise over the ability to pay back debt. This will cause funding costs for New Zealand retail banks to increase, which will decrease investment spending, lowering pressures on aggregate demand. Chinese growth is expected to be 7.6% this year. Although still very strong compared to New Zealand's other trading partners, this is down from the previous year. It is likely that this will decrease Chinese demand for New Zealand exports, decreasing our net exports and easing inflationary pressure. However, this has been temporarily offset with the easing of Chinese monetary policy and increasing of Chinese discretionary incomes. In the previous two quarters, the Reserve Bank of Australia lowered the OCR by a total of 0.75% to stimulate growth. Now, as we can see here, from March to September 2009, when the Australian OCR decreases, this results in an influx of funds into the New Zealand financial account, as we now offer a relatively more attractive return on investment. Thus, we can expect investment spending to increase, adding to pressures on AD. In the United States, unemployment for 2012, as of yet, has been unpromising, alternating between 8.3% and 8.2%. This upset financial markets modestly, which have since recovered. However, due to the high GDP to debt ratio the United States has, it is introducing austerity measures in February next year to cut the deficit. With the economy stagnating since 2010, there are concerns that this may push the United States back into recession. This may result in New Zealand's money and export markets drying up. Thus, we may see investment spending and export receipts decreasing, easing pressures on AD. Oil prices have also decreased recently due to the global slowdown, which will ease cost push inflation considerably, given it being a significant raw material in the production process for New Zealand firms. The New Zealand TWI has depreciated since the release of the previous monetary policy statement, as reflected in the TWI with the substantial decrease in June. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand has decided to monitor this trend closely to see if it persists in the long term before acting on it. As we can see, since 2012, commodity prices have decreased considerably, this being attributable to the global slowdown. On inspecting this trend, dairy prices are experiencing substantial decreases, one of New Zealand's chief exports. This will reduce our terms of trade, our export receipts 
and our net exports easing inflationary pressure. Unemployment has increased modestly of late due to higher labour force participation rates, not higher redundancies. This is expected to continue to put downward pressure on wages and easing cost push inflation. Employment, however, has increased since December, increasing incomes. This should modestly increase consumption spending and aggregate demand. Though the recent zero budget issued by the government announced no new spending, it is still expansionary as government borrowing is expected to increase until 2014, which is an injection. This is supported by predictions that government will still be in deficit until 2014. An operating deficit run by the government will increase AD, maintaining some inflationary pressure. Business confidence has decreased since February as New Zealand firms are unwilling to increase operations. However, the National Bank made the comment business confidence is still very healthy and is higher than the low in 2008. Hence, investment spending will decrease only modestly, easing downward pressures on AD and inflation. In the long term, business confidence is likely to increase due to the Canterbury rebuild. It is projected the government will spend over $4 billion in the Cantabrian region until 2016. This will increase AD and maintain some underlying inflationary pressures in the medium term. A recent development has been the rate war, where retail banks have been aggressively cutting interest rates. Although this has increased households' discretionary income, this discretionary income is being used to service debt, as we can see with the decrease in household debt since 2009. Hence, this will have no substantial impact on AD nor inflation. Consumer confidence is also uninspiring with continued lower expectations of future economic conditions, illustrating perfectly the wide-reaching effects of the international turbulence. It is also important to remember that New Zealand still has a negative output gap due to high unemployment, hence increases in inflationary pressures are less significant at the current time compared to when we were operating at a peak such as in 2007. In conclusion, in consideration of the policy target agreement, it is best to leave the OCR unchanged at 2.5%. In the short term, we have an influx of Australian funds into the New Zealand financial account, increase in investment spending. We have a strengthening labour market, resulting in increased consumption spending. High business confidence also resulting in high levels of investment spending and small increases in discretionary spending due to lower retail interest rates. These events have increased pressures on AD. Offsetting these inflationary pressures is slowing Chinese demand for New Zealand exports, decreasing our net exports, financial shocks from American data, decreasing investment spending, the weak European climate, which is likely to see funding costs increase, decreasing investment spending, and decreasing commodity prices, lowering our export receipts and AD. These, coupled with the output gap, indicate it is best at the current time to leave the OCR unchanged at 2.5%. However, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has also considered long-term trends. With a global slowdown likely due to the American and European economic climates, it is likely the New Zealand dollar will depreciate such as when it did in 2008, increasing cost push inflation. Business confidence may also increase due to the Canterbury rebuild However, oil prices will drop significantly, the labour market will weaken as we also saw in 2008, commodity prices will fall as global demand for dairy products decreases and spare capacity will further increase due to higher unemployment, further offsetting inflationary pressures. Hence, to prevent a deflationary cycle in the long term, it is in the interest of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand to keep the OCR at 2.5% in order to maintain a buffer in order to stimulate the economy in the case of such a scenario. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your presentation, well done. So now we'll move on to questions and answers. Um, just, it's just going to be like what the regional presentations were, so we're going to ask you a question, what we'd like is if you discussed it amongst yourselves before someone summarising that and bringing it back, which would be good. The difference is we've got 20 minutes rather than 10. Okay, so first question. Um, what are the consequences if the government doesn't make a budget surplus by 2014, 2015? Well, the main thing is, I think, you know, the IMF has said... Oh, no. No. <laughs> Sorry. 
the IMF has said that uh, you know New Zealand is on a good track, and they've said that you know our government's doing a good job compared to other countries. And if we weren't able to make the targets that we've said we can, you know, there's going to be a loss in confidence in New Zealand. Credit ratings. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if if yeah. there was a possible downgrade, what would that result in? A possible downgrade could be um, an increased funding cost for New Zealand. And that will lead to New Zealand having more debt. Yeah, mm. and then so higher borrowing costs. Yeah. Yeah. Less investment spending, maybe. Yeah. It'll yeah. also be harder to get um, funding in the future mm. if we're not shown to be able to get, meet our targets and repay debt when we say we will be able to. Mm, certainly, mm. but if we're also not. Also trust. Yeah, if we're not hitting that uh, budget surplus, then we're in a budget deficit, so it still means that the government spending would be stimulatory for longer. And certainly they've indicated that if things were to go you know, downwards further in Europe, they would adjust their targets and push the surplus out further than 2014, 15 or 15, 16, when, when they're expecting to achieve that surplus. So what is the core result of this, then? The core result what if we don't get the sur surplus by 14, 15? Mm, it's going to be a... Uh, Basically, lower confidence yeah. for producers, um, for investors mm. in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. So aggregate, aggregate demand on whole would increase even with the government uh, keeping expansionary spending in. So it would be uh, down, down yeah, pressure down. on inflation. Yeah. Mm. So um, we think that if the New Zealand government wasn't able to achieve its uh, surplus target of 2014-15, you know, there'd be a loss of confidence uh, in markets. A bit funding costs for New Zealand could increase. We, you know, we've had this whole deal with credit downgrades before, and that could we could see a repeat of that in New Zealand, which could increase funding costs and put downward pressure on inflation. But then, on the flip side of that, if there's no surplus, government spending remains expansionary. So there is some offsetting factors on the deflationary pressure. Okay, thanks. Okay, so with the economic environment that you describe, do you see the impact of cutting rates has diminished? Yeah, well, it certainly has. I mean, we've been, because uh, of that, debt levels are so high, even with low interest rates, it's really, the economy is really struggling to uh, get some momentum, some velocity of circulation. And you can see it in that graph with um, households mm. choosing to pay off debt as opposed yeah. to spending more even though interest rates are at record lows. Yeah. Due to the low confidence that we have. Here's a question. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be doing the same thing it was at the start, you know, and there's also now an expectation of rates being lower for longer. Yeah. 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 Um, it doesn't, yeah, because even though interest rates are at 2.5%, the last quarter of inflation, we're still 1%, which is the absolute bottom of, you know, the PTA target agreement yeah. that we can have. I think a lot of people don't want to splash out on their new house yet because they're still servicing the debt and mm. they don't expect the prices to rise yeah. in the near future, so they think they can hold out. And no matter how low interest rates go, if people don't have confidence about the future, which the validity overseas and which you know, climate has created, yeah. then you know people aren't going to borrow even if the cost of financing their borrowing is much lower. Yeah, they've learned their lesson. And yeah. if they're not confident of keeping their jobs, they're less willing to take on debt as well. Mm. Yeah, there's yeah. basically a lot of uncertainty, which we, which is why people mm. aren't spending, even though there are lower interest rates. Mm. Yeah, it's just the international climate is not good either. Mm. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, overall, with their current economic conditions, what that's done is that scared consumers. They don't want to take on more debt at the moment. So what that means is when there are changes in the OCR, yeah. even if it decreases, they're not going to necessarily be inclined to take on more debt because they're scared of you know the possible default. Are they still going to have their jobs? So answering that question, um, no, the OCR hasn't been as effective as it was in previous years yeah. in um, controlling um, inflation. Thank you. Uh, why does the Reserve Bank target inflation rather than other things like growth or exports? Because inflation um, is like a direct, like it's um, conflict of interest, co like consequence of. And like it's growth. in the PTA yeah. as well. I mean, it was the yeah. specific purpose, wasn't it, to target yeah. inflation? Well, the policy target agreement was all always about when it was introduced getting inflation under control because before that we had high periods of inflation mm. and that seemed to lead to more unstable growth so although the government may have a goal of growth inflation yeah. price stability is absolutely key to that 
Yeah. With high inflation, a lot of businesses mm -hmm. didn't have couldn't plan for the future, so they didn't have business confidence, and yeah. this um, decreased through um, investment spending, which yeah, discouraged I mean, yeah, saving like, as well. Yeah, they also couldn't, like they couldn't afford to actually expand and take on new debt because it was too expensive. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, inflation is like it has lots of consequences and a huge effect on growth as well. So by controlling inflation, you're controlling growth as well. Yeah, because investment spending really does drive growth. And if there's no confidence in the price stability, then you know the temptation is to spend money now and forego consumption in the future, which is going to have uh, less mean, less stable growth over time. So price stability does is the key factor. Is the key factor that creates stable growth. When inflation was really high, um, a lot of people spent m like money on assets such as property and stuff. So property prices went up really high, mm. and it's having pretty bad consequences on the economy right now. Yeah. yeah. Sort of yeah, sure thing. Um, so the Reserve Bank, although it does target price stability, not growth, indirectly they are in a way targeting growth because price stability leads to uh, more longer term growth, longer term higher growth. Okay, based on your thinking and your answer, would you think it wise or foolish to change the Reserve Bank's mandate to target inflation? Doing mm. what we're doing, or should we change? Is that the range of the PTA? Mm. That would require changing the PTA, of course. Yes. Yeah. Like the aim of the PTA, or like. Mm. Sorry? As in the aim of the PTA, or the well, range? Is it a good thing that the Reserve Bank is targeting inflation rather than other um. factors, try, such mm. as trying to stimulate growth in the economy? Yeah. Well, the PTA, you wouldn't want to alter it. Uh, to the lower end of the band to one or to less than zero percent because you know there's a deflationary spell at that end so I think the focus of that where you could possibly change it would be at three percent so it'd be four percent five percent which isn't going to be um, you know too disastrous if we get to four or five percent inflation mm -hmm. if it that's still reasonably stable but is inflation well, I'm not, I'm not yeah, changing the number of the, in the PTA, I'm actually inflation. thinking, check out the word inflation, inflation or replace it with a different word like growth. Like growth. Yeah. Should we do that or not do that? You, well, um, the PTA only looks at inflation, so if we looked at growth, for example, yeah. when you lower the OCR traditionally and that results in more consumption spending and things like that and that drives growth, then inflation also mm -hmm. rises as well yeah. so yeah. it's difficult to control those two factors keep one down yeah. and the other up yeah so. and, and in better economic conditions if our sole goal was growth keeping growth high you know you'd just have low interest rates for longer you wouldn't even consider putting them up and that could you know that leads to um inflation could actually get way too high and then the growth goal can actually fall out of line mm. because you've made you know looked at the medium term to try and get uh, growth high but because of all that foregone consumption that you know, they don't want to spend for the future because they can't plan because inflation is too high. In the past, we've seen the effects of extremely high inflation and that overall it's been bad for the economy. So therefore, I think it is wise that the Reserve Bank is targeting yeah. inflation rather than growth. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at the 80s when we had record growth, I mean, inflation, you look at the levels of it and you've, yeah. you really need About that PTA range and you need control yeah. them and stuff, yeah. 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 That was about... It, yeah, I wouldn't say it isn't. I wouldn't say it's foolish to target inflation at all because I really, you know, we really do think this group that um, it is key to getting that kind of stable growth. And if we were to focus more on growth and ignore things like price stability over the long term, the growth goals can just go out the window. That's a much. Yeah. Thank you. you did mention in the policy targets agreement that the the current target is between one and three percent. Why the numbers one and three? Because it was um, well, below one, it would be too low. Yeah, deflationary. Yeah, yeah, you risk a deflationary cycle happening mm. where um, the purchasing power of the currency increases and then that discourages things like investment and spending and then that further mm. lowers AD and the deflationary cycle keeps continuing mm. and that can result in things like you know, high unemployment, for example, and other factors um, as there's that lack of spending for firms and stuff. And above that band, so, the like risk yeah, I mean that's it used to be zero to three percent, didn't it? And they moved it to one three percent just to keep uh, medium term inflation well clear of getting anywhere near zero, so that that deflationary spiral spiral we can you know pretty safely avoid. And then I guess three percent as the top end, you don't want inflation to get too high because as we said, high inflation. 
yeah, makes hard to pay. It discourages saving. It encourages short-term spending, and you know uns- those kind of unsustainable growth trends we we're just talking about. And we'll take, if inflation is high, we'll take on more debt currently, mm-hmm. which will put us yeah. in a worse position in the future because mm-hmm. we'll have to pay back that debt. Yeah. The destable price. Opportunity cost of taking on that debt is future consumption spending. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, having a certain band helps inflation keep between a certain event so that it doesn't go up yeah. and down, up and down and create a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. But I mean, if it was 4%, that wouldn't, would that be a big, <laughs> a big deal? I mean, it could, 3, 4, is it, I mean, how arbitrary yeah, is that? It's important to say that target, though. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 if you say 4, it could go 5. And so do you want me to sum that up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the, the reason why it's between 1% to 3% is if it's below 1%, you risk a deflationary cycle occurring. And you don't want that to happen because it can be very, very difficult to res- um, reverse that. Um, monetary policy um, or the OCR, that won't be enough to do it um, because consumers may, they won't necessarily take home more debt and um, spend it. Um, and above that range, above that 3%, if you go too high, then that's going to discourage investment spending because firms are not going to be able to plan adequately in the future. Um, the savings, they'll lose their real value and you don't want that happening either. Okay, good. Thank you. So... It's a curious thing that the Reserve Bank has the power to change interest rates, which has a big impact on the economy, and not the Prime Minister or the Minister of Finance. Why is that the case? I think, yeah. And more independent as well. Yeah, well, it's, it's, the government, they have the goals of um, keeping unemployment <laughs> low, because mm-hmm. they want to keep as many, you know, ultimately they want to get yeah. into the next election, so they want to keep that unemployment low, they want to keep as many people employed, they want to keep growth high, rate um, increases in income, that sort of thing and um, that ultimately can cause inflation and they may disregard that or they may not be able to keep two mm-hmm. both features under control adequately. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So bank is like independent so it makes them make better decisions mm-hmm. at times. Bank is specialised and yeah. being... Well, also, it's also the same thing, you know, the government minister of finance could decide for a different policy target agreements. It could be based on the exchange rate, you know, mm-hmm. balance of payments. Those are the kind of things they could target instead of price stability. So they set the policy. The Reserve Bank re- isn't really a policy setter at all. It's a policy implementer. Yeah. And the, gov- the government, the Minister of Finance, trusts in the uh, governor of the Reserve Bank to implement that policy. And, you know, use the tools available to him to implement that policy independent of political trends or whatever the government's doing. And I think that was a decision when the Reserve Bank was set up just so that future governments can't go, you know, not very easily at least, go around messing mm-hmm. with and that suit their own independence. interests rather than yeah. the overall greater good for mm-hmm. the New Zealand economy. Yeah, because if the go- government has too much control over monetary uh, policy and it's not independent, you can get things like hyperinflation, you know, very easily if you want to fund some election promises. <laughs> or corruption. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. So. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand doesn't uh, get into policy setting, they're in the business of policy implementing and the Minister of Finance entrusts the Reserve Bank to do that as effectively as possible and when the Reserve Bank was set up it was all about independence, It was the whole idea was that future governments wouldn't be able to use monetary policy for their you know, short term political benefit when it can be disastrous for the economy if inflation gets too high or too low or things like that. So price stability was agreed upon at that time to be important and maintain that independence and the Reserve Bank to do that. So do you think the Reserve Bank should intervene in the currency market currently to reduce the value of the New Zealand dollar? Do you want our opinion? (laughs) (laughs) Yep. We want your reasoning. Oh, we want your reasoning. Is that like yeah, the New Zealand dollar, I mean, it's, um, last time mm-hmm. I checked, I think it was 0.81 cents mm-hmm. per um, US dollar. Uh, it had risen from 0.8 cents per US dollar. Mm-hmm. And uh, ultimately that's negative for our exporters. We mm-hmm. need to give them that competitive advantage overseas. But we've got to remember that while the US dollar, the euro, the pound is increasing, the Australian dollar is decreasing against us. Mm-hmm. And they're our primary export Exporter. market. Yeah. Well, but the problem is if the Reserve Bank is setting a price. I mean, if we had a fixed exchange rate where they were the sole buyer and sell of currency and they were buying it, selling it to keep it, you know, at a proportion of another financial asset, then you can get all sorts of problems with supply and demand of dollars and that can lead to, you know, allocative yeah. inefficiency in the New Zealand economy. Yeah, um, if we lower the OCR even more to depreciate the dollar, how are we going to get the funds mm. for our government deficit? Yes, yeah. that money supply as well changing that buying and selling currency mm. the open yeah. operations. And we also require a huge change in the 
policy uh, yeah, target policy. agreement because I, th- I think you know yes it would help exporters to have that uh, lower dollar right now but you know a lot of New Zealanders lifestyles are built around imports what would happen to our quality of life if the price of many of our goods and services went up it can actually be inflationary in that yeah. sense yeah. and plus with the Christchurch rebuild we need all these raw imported raw materials yeah, yeah so an increase in cost of raw materials yeah. especially since like all the raw materials are quite Costly. expensive right now and doing this it means that the Reserve Bank will basically be shifting their focus from controlling inflation to growth because that's what they'll be targeting. Increasing exports will be trying to increase growth. Mm. Are you just talking, sorry, can I ask you a question? Is it just a short term get, you know, getting this dollar back into a more desirable level for exporters or are you talking about like a fixed currency? More of a short term thing. Is it, sorry? More of a short term. Short, short term fix. Short term okay. intervention, yeah. Yeah, so it's not a fixed currency. Okay, mm. well, bringing yeah. up that point as well is um, what will happen in the long term, and then look at how the currency is going up and down. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the previous uh, monetary policy statement, it was um, at uh, it had depreciated to 0.77 um, um, cents per US dollar, mm-hmm. and that happened in the space of a couple of months. And mm-hmm. what, what's going to happen if we leave it a little bit longer? I mean, well, how is the situation in the United States going to develop and that mm-hmm. sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. well, they're starting to get some positive data from the US, rather than it being all negative, which could help to control the dollar. Okay. So, on balance, um, should the Reserve Bank intervene in short term to uh, get the currency down, we'd probably say there are you know some good things. Obviously, it would be good for exporters. It would help our balance of trade and things like that. But there are also a lot of awesome factors that could be in direct conflict with their policy target agreement to help keep inflation in that band. So you got a bit of a conflict of policies if we start to try to do that. Um, also, yes, the supply and demand issues and you know, efficiency, allocative efficiency in the New Zealand markets could be you know, threatened and reducing foreign investment as well, things like that, depending, yeah. And also the Christchurch, we need the input of raw materials. Mm, yeah, also for the Christchurch rebuild, yeah, in the short term fix, it's just going to increase prices down there where they really don't need it right now. And yeah. there's that idea of giving the markets more time to develop mm-hmm. and see what happens. Yeah. It goes back down to although we yeah and, and although we're at the lower end of the band already, you know I guess that could help inflation a little bit, but it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so with uh, all of the uncertainty in Europe at the moment, what are the right policies for Greece to pursue it at present? <laughs> <The> right. <laughs> Again, you want our opinion? Um, <laughs> There is a couple of options. There's um, several they options. could uh, keep true. bailing them out and give them mm. sufficient time mm. to cut the deficit, or they could kick them out of the eurozone. Mm. And um, so you're thinking about European policies. Yes. The question was, what should Greece do? Right? Yeah, what, Greece what should do? Greece do? So if you were advising the Greek government, what would you tell uh, them? How would you solve their problem? Hmm. Without leaving the eurozone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crucial that they get that debt problem under control. Because they can't, uh, because they can't afford the, yeah. um, they can't afford the interest payments on those bonds currently, um, and we're seeing the effects of that. Um, in in complete isolation of Europe and the wider economy, the yeah. best thing for Greece to do is to leave the monetary union and yeah. adopt the drachma, so that their currency can be nicely devalued and they can get their export markets mm. and economy back growing again. But that's in complete isolation of everything else that's going on in Europe. So the best is this considering people. everyone else yeah. as well? No, he didn't. He didn't say <laughs> so. you, you heard me said just Greece. Uh, so I'd say Greece. Yeah, you know, definitely the best thing is to leave the monetary union and you know have the export markets go up. Short term, at least. I mean, long term, that gives them much more autonomy to uh, manipulate their currency, which they don't have now, which has actually, in some ways, been good because they've been forced mm. to go through all this austerity that they wouldn't have had to otherwise if they weren't part of that union. But in the short term, certainly leaving it seems to be the right call for Greece. Thank you. We can now relax. We're we're all done. Well done.